I can share my screen. Critical question today. When was the last time you gave somebody a real high five? <laughs> not, a, not an emoji high five. <laughs> no, no, emojis don't count, apparently. Uh, I honestly don't remember. And yesterday, I love it. And this morning, I... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that for everybody that doesn't remember you, we all have tasks. So, which is to give somebody a high five <laughs> in the next day or two. <laughs> I did it recently, but I don't remember where or when. It was like a meetup or something, but and yeah, it's in the last month, maybe. Did you initiate it? No, I never initiate them, but I'm I'm happy to participate <laughs> if someone else wants to. <laughs> You're not going to leave them hanging there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember I gave it to my daughter. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. Nice. I want to know. I want to know if the up high too slow down low too slow. Does that count as a high five or? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that counts. All right. Um, it looks like. Uh oh, it looks like I'm the only one that doesn't remember. So I, <laughs> I'm the one that has a job to do. My daughter's here, so I'll finish this meeting up and make her give me a high five. <laughs> so, all right, I just have a a couple things today, but I think this this might um, generate some discussion. And so the the first one is um, we're looking at it, in the OSPO, the corporate side of. OSPOs, kind of these stages of growth. Mm. So we've been talking about maturity models as a way to kind of frame the metrics that might be useful um, within university OSPOs, you know, to, to kind of address different stages of maturity model. And as part of that, we're kind of doing this a similar task in the corporate OSPO side of things. And on the, the corporate side, there was actually a, a published metric model, and I'll bring it up here. Um, and I think it was Chris Anacek who had put it together. At least that's who wrote the article where I found this. The article, you can see it down here at the bottom. Um, and so when I had originally presented it, the different maturity models, it was around things like um, the value of an OSPO was one of the proposed maturity models that I presented. And another maturity model was uh, something along the lines of, you know, like supporting open source within the organization. The, the maturity, and it's, I think it's everybody at least had a positive reception to it with some work that needs to be done. Um, but kind of investigating further, this is a maturity model. This is the one that I came across from, from Chris on that publication below. And it's, it's OSPO stages of growth. So it takes a slightly different angle towards things. And those, the top, across the top, the adoption, education, engagement, and leadership are what I pulled really just directly from. <laughs> from not that, from this. I combined them a little bit, but. So I, I just pulled from there and I thought, you know, there's really no need for us to redo things that maybe speak to, to how people think about OSPOs, at least in the corporate sense. So I'm curious if if a stages of growth approach might be helpful from a university OSPO perspective. Um, Saeed, you know, maybe you could speak to that a little bit if this, it all resonates with, you know, how you think about OSPOs, both at Hopkins and at Carnegie Mellon. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it does. Um, I, I don't think in Hopkins we had formalized it in the way that you're showing here. Yeah. Uh, I think at Carnegie Mellon that is happening, um, in particular because of uh, the, the community manager we hired, somebody named Tom Hughes, who actually has a background, has a very interesting mm -hmm. background that includes advertising, marketing, things like that. So he's he's actually thinking along these lines. Okay. Um, and eventually, uh, for, for the Sloan grant to Carnegie Mellon, one of the things, uh, one of the deliverables we promised is a so-called logic model. Um, so you know, inputs, outputs, outcomes, so on. So I, I think, I think that, yeah, I, I think this makes a lot of sense it, as a framework for university hospitals. Obviously, there's different facets. 
of course um, that, yes. that would that would fall into those buckets um you know the question i have is um yeah it's a uh so so the question i have is tying this back to you know <laughs> university open source metrics right um so I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of you know a researcher or even a student for that matter, um, in terms of what motivates them to think about open source and assess, you know, I've been quote successful with, with my open source project. And I don't know that thinking that the OSPO has become successful or matured is one of the ways that they would think that. So that's mm -hmm. that's probably the overarching question I would have. Yeah, that's fair. Um is there ways that you in the OSPO are encouraging that? Yeah, um, I, I'm happy to say uh, just in the past two weeks, I've been contacted by two different faculty members about getting involved in their NSF proposals. So I think, you, you know, and that, that two out of God knows how many are submitted to our email in any given week. But well, nonetheless, right. <laughs> the, 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 the fact that two of them proactively reached out to me, I'm taking as, you know, maybe a, a stage of growth uh, mm -hmm. in, in terms of sort of the adoption or the education pieces and so on. Um, so I think, I guess the way I put it is if a university has an OSPO, I think it's a good place. And obviously I'm biased, but I think it's a good place to track some of these metrics, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and in a, I don't know, ideal or future, whatever state, uh, if the OSPA at CMU can be a place that says, we know the following number of proposals, mention open source software, are planning to produce open source software, or are working directly with the OSPO, or be contributed to the uh, data software management plan, whatever. Uh, that's the role I could see you know, for, for an OSPO sort of becoming the clearinghouse of that kind of information. But again, it would have to be tied to, you know, the metrics that the faculty care about. One of them, clear, in my opinion, one of them clearly is how many proposals, you know, include open source software. Um, that, that would be a very important, kind of, if we could track that, that would be an important thing to have in, in a university setting. Okay, I have a few comments. One, can you speak to why they approached you the two um or if not that's okay we are being recorded so yeah no, no no it's totally fine no but well, what's your second question as well maybe it's tied well the second question is when i look at like this model here it's a bit longer of a so this is about trying to define say the objectives around legal education as an example and uh -huh. again this is from an industry perspective so like, sure. we have to rework this and then it's the metrics or the metrics models that help reveal that particular objective. Uh -huh. um, and so one of the challenges that I do have in this is that there is a tendency that the OSPO view and the employee view, which in your case would be, say, the OSPO view and the researcher view, right. they do kind of collapse on each other in this maturity model. And I, 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 I have a, I, like sometimes the metrics are clearly for the OSPO and sometimes they sure. are clearly for, for the employee. So I'm not sure if right. we tease that out in two different models or it's okay to, to kind of live collapsed. So yeah. I think it's more of a comment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so to your, to your question, um, the, these are, these are two different kinds of categories of proposals. One is large CMU wide multi-institutional partnerships, um, really kind of uh, whatever you want to call it, hurting the cats or whatever by, by the vice president for research. So sort of at that senior level of the institution. And she basically said, we want an open science and open source component. And I know that, you know, the OSPO can help um, or, you know, hope the OSPO can help. Uh, so that's, that's one example. Um, you know, and I hope that's a category that continues to, to happen. The second is, an, you know, individual investigator has uh, a particular project um, that he wants to build a community around. I don't think it's going to be some large, you know, multi-institutional effort or so, so whatever. So kind of nice bookends of typical proposals in a university context, I suppose. But in both cases, there's no question some of that had to do with my sort of direct outreach 
in this case with the VPR or with the faculty member uh, in question. So I think that that the seeds that were planted percolated and now they're, they're working on proposals are like, oh, okay, let's go talk to these, these folks over in the OSPO uh, about the role they can play. And hopefully they're talking to others and, and that's how it'll spread. Gotcha. You know, to your comment, um, you know, I guess one, maybe one way of thinking about this is like, you know, what direction does the arrow flow? Um, if, the, if there's, and maybe this is simplistic, if there's two ways of thinking about this, one is, you know, we develop a set of metrics for university open source, we start socializing them and people start embracing them and, and applying them. How will that help the OSPO with its stages of growth, right? Um, versus may not be the right word. It's compared to focusing on the OSPO stages of growth. Will that help with university, you know, metrics of university open source? I think the former is much more likely, right? Okay. That if that if we put the metrics out there, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not saying either of these, you know, proposals of Carnegie Mellon was motivated by this, but if there is a metric that says, you know, you'll be rewarded or recognized or whatever the right word is, if you use or produce open source in your proposals, you know, that's a metric faculty can look at and say, cool, yes, I, I'm I'm planning to do that anyway. So here's the check mark and give me whatever, you know, I don't know, nugget. Reduction <laughs> in <laughs> FA. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That that ultimately is what it'll come down to. Can I get more of the cost? Um, so you know, whatever award makes sense. Um, that I think can ultimately be. Hey, who's going to track all this, right? Well, the OSPO is a good place to track that, right? And therefore, if the OSPO is tracking it, you know, what's the next stage of evolution is we're not just tracking it. It's, hey, you're about to submit a proposal doing open source around robotics. Are you aware that that other group at Carnegie Mellon just submitted a proposal with open source around robotics? Maybe you should talk to each other. So that gets to more of the building relationships and so on. Um, it's just the OSPO is still very new in a university, right? Um, and it just, I don't, I don't know that either of the people who contacted me contacted me because I'm in the OSPO. They contacted me because I can help them with open source. Gotcha. Okay. So OSPO just became a label. What's that? John? <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's, like, it's, a, it's like a flag waving. Hey, I can talk. OSPO has open source stuff. I can ask them. Right. Sounds like. Right. Yeah. That's a good I know it. I know in the case of my university, when I was, I was talking with my associate dean about some things that she wants to open source in her lab, and uh, there, her, her, there were there's sort of two perspectives. The faculty perspective from for other faculty who work around this space is they'd like to have permanent staff or what we might call research software engineers to help maintain these things. And her perspective is she needs help understanding open source. And, and so... I think these are both university OSPO functions potentially. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes mm -hmm. sense. So, say you you believe that like empowering the researchers is probably the a smarter approach to start. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it it's it more naturally aligns. With okay. my experience in terms yep. of how they're motivated um i also think i i do hope someday we have many many hospitals universities yep. um and i know sloan is you know is about to announce i hope is about to announce some more so i think we're you know we're getting there but i you know there are there are more universities that don't have hospitals that do right um so a, a message that's more about metrics around open source is going to resonate with every university interested in open source, but if it's okay. OSPO specific, then many might say, well, we don't have an OSPO, we don't, and we don't really care about these. So is it your role at, in the OSPO to, to kind of lead that for faculty through whatever it is, like outreach or education? Like, how is that disseminated <laughs> throughout? Yeah. The <laughs> well, I, I like, I like Sean's uh, use of the word label. Uh, yeah. I think that's a, that's a very nice um, neutral term to begin with, right? Um, any of you who have worked or work in a university know, uh, and anytime somebody shows and says, I have a new unit and I'm going to take ownership of X, whatever that might be, um, there's a risk always of somebody saying, no, no, I own X 
or why are you doing that? And, you know, are you yeah. stepping on my toes and so on? Um, m- you know, my, I think I, uh, I, mm. you know, Stephanie, uh, shared the sort of scoping and charge document that she and I've been working on the last meeting. And one of the things I think I mentioned it, and if I didn't, I, I will is, um, you know, an OSPO is never going to be able to go to even a vice president for research and say, here are the metrics you should use to sort of assess faculty outputs, you know, whatever, um, in, in, in open source. But, you know, could a network of BPRs go to the American Association of Universities and the American Republic and Land Grant Universities, whatever, say, hey, we need to get more serious about open source. You know, there's a working group in Helios for those who are familiar with it. I did reach out to them and, and they're interested in potentially working together. Um, those groups are the ones that will ultimately be able to go to provosts, right? Who ultimately have to make the decision and say, yes, these are really important metrics. I want them included in promotion and tenure review. And, and uh, you, as you know, it's not just the provosts, the deans, individual departments, all that kind of stuff. So um, I think, again, it, it's, it's OSPO is a means, right, to get these things started, these conversations started and to get together, not, not, not as the end that the OSPO is going to own this, because what faculty members going to care if I tell them, hey, I'm giving you a check mark. Who, who are you? Why, why should I care? Um, but if the provost or the dean or the department head says that, that's very different. And, and I don't know what it's like at uh, your university, but right now when you bring up open source in any context, you always have to talk to legal. And I, I think, I don't maybe that's not universal. I have no idea. But an OSPO would provide some group that can answer questions and help with open source stuff and the navigation of that environment without having to first talk to legal. Yeah. Uh, plus one, uh, yeah. <laughs> and 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 legal includes tech transfer, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. They, yeah, they, they, yes. they have legal. They, they have lawyers on staff, so it's not. Yeah, it's not a stretch. Yeah. Um, yeah. I will tell you that you know, again, to your point, um, faculty have said to me, "I don't want to talk to legal or tech transfer." Uh, <laughs> yeah, for whatever reason, good, bad, right, wrong. Um, it's just time consuming. It's it's time consuming. <laughs> um, but but I, I still want to talk about open source. So yeah, I think the OSPO can be, um, and 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 I, don't get me wrong. I've reached out to Tech Transfer and said I want to be your ally, right? I'm not going to reinforce yeah, absolutely. this. Faculty don't talk to you. Um, I'm just I could potentially be the first person they talk to about open source, but then I'm going to point them to resources that you have, uh, and there, so on. There's a lot of questions before there's a a line of code written in some cases that right. you could answer that don't require the longer conversations that tech trends for whomever. And don't have to get immediately yeah. into commercialization and, and things like that. Exactly, yeah. I'm just writing my proposal. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay, so this is super helpful to me. I mean, what I'd like to do is kind of reflect on this conversation and kind of bring it back um, to to something like this. Again, this model is more for the corporate side of things, but just trying to frame the conversation sure. a little bit that could be helpful. Um, yeah. You had mentioned that you have some deliverables for Sloan as well with respect mm-hmm. to road mapping. Did I hear that right? Uh, a logic model. Logic um, model. Yeah, so I'm I'm not an expert on logic models, yeah. so please please don't walk away thinking, oh, you know, Saeed knows what a logic model is. <laughs> uh, you know, from what I understand, it's just a, a a formalized kind of framework of looking at what are the inputs going into something. In this case, an OSPO or CMU OSPO. Um, you know, what are the out, outputs which are can be documents and things like that, right? Sort of tangible assets, if you will. But then what are the outcomes, right? If the outcome is, so an output could be, we supported X number of proposals through the OSPO, but the outcome could be that as part of the research process, CMU faculty now know, oh, I I can always go talk to the OSPO if I wanna learn about open source before I submit a proposal um, or while I'm working on a proposal. So the logic model is just sort of codifies that and formalizes it. Um, and this is where Tom, 
uh, you know, our community manager, he he was showing me these kinds of things that you do in, in the marketing advertising world, right? It's sort of market segmentation um, and, you know, variable services based on all this kind of stuff, all new to me, but it made a lot of sense, right? So he's, he's basically looking at that in terms of each of the divisions in the schools, like a different market, right? I, I mean, that sounds obvious when you hear it, but when he puts it into that terminology and then starts saying, you know, we need a different kind of service to learn computer science than we do for the College of Fine Arts. And in the marketing world, this is how you would do it. And there's sort of this diagrammatic way he's showing that. So I think that's the foundation for this, this logic model gotcha. that we're looking at. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I'm going to, Don, I don't know if you're on right now. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, like a lot of this conversation is that Saeed is talking about is reminding me of like OSPOs in a corporate setting like eight to 10 years ago. Like how do we, how do we um, make them available within the organization? How do we socialize them within the organization? How do we align them with the C-level office? Like a lot of this type of work and so like I look at the model that I have here and this is again for corporate this is probably a lot further down the line and I'm wondering if if you have thoughts about that period of time in the corporate side yeah I mean I, I do think the university authors have quite a bit to learn from um, some of the corporate corporate ospos from just kind of where we've been and how we've gotten to where we are now um I think I think Broadly speaking, one of the challenges with this, this OSPO kind of stages, stages of growth models is that, um, and I think you see this in university settings too, based on what Saeed was just talking about. I think that OSPOs evolve in very different ways and they don't all go through the same stages of, of growth. They don't necessarily all have all of the, all of the things there are. There are loads of OSPOs that are really just corporate OSPOs that are really just kind of focused on, on the compliance and legal pieces. And then there are loads of OSPOs, kind of like the one we have at VMware, which also have engineering resources and community and all sorts of other things. Um, so I think I think one of the challenges we have with, with putting this together in, in kind of a any any sort of model, like a in, in stages of growth model included, I think what we struggle with is that a lot of the OSPOs are at very different places. And so like Saeed was describing, you know, the OSPOs that we're seeing in universities are kind of like a lot of the OSPOs that we were seeing, you know, before in the, in the corporate world. Although to be honest, I mean, I think that there are lots of companies just starting OSPOs that are going through that same path, right? Trying to get it communicated so that people know, know that they exist, know what they do. Um, and then to build up those kind of robust processes and best practices, I think is um, is, is a similar challenge. I don't know, Saeed, if you'd agree with that. Yeah, no, spot on. Um, you know, and I think if I go back 8, 10, 12 years in universities, it also reminds me of the beginning of sort of the research data management services movement mm -hmm. that, that's happened over the last decade or so. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you fast mm -hmm. forward to today, um, you know, my former institution has a very robust team and, and lots of, you know, capacity and, and technical capabilities and runs a data archive and so on. But then you have other universities where it's literally one person, right? Maybe even part of that person's job. It may not be a full-time role. Um, I suspect we'll have something similar with university hospitals, right? Is that some universities will really embrace it, may go down the path of providing even technical support, who knows? But others, either because they just don't, you know, produce as much or consume as much or don't have the staffing, don't have the resources, whatever, won't ever have an OSPO. They won't have an office, right? But they may have a person that you can go talk to. Um, so, you know, that that's why, you know, I come back to the idea that if we have, you know, a set of metrics for, for everyone, right, no matter how large your open source team might be, that those metrics will span, you know, pretty much every university, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then, and then, you know, down to your point, universities then look at that and say, okay, we need to really formalize this into a group and this group's going to do the following, or we don't, um, or we have a person who, you know, is, is basically the person who does this, or we don't have any of that. And we decide it's in a research software group or an academic computing group or whatever the case may be. 
Yeah, and we see we see a similar thing sort of across the board on the on the corporate side as well. So so Bloomberg, which is a you know quite a large company, they had an OSPO of one person for a very long time. Um, I think it might actually still be one person, but the way that they did that was that that person was sort of like a coordinating point. Um, but there were loads of people who were doing the the actual open source work within within other departments. Um, and so so they had they had this this OSPO of one, even though they also had loads of people working on working on open source throughout the company in various ways. Um, so you get at these like very different structures, right? Yeah. De very different different ways of of doing this. I mean, even at VMware, we have a you know a relatively large open source program office compared to some of the others, but we still most of the open source work actually happens within our business units. Um, the people who are working on the products that rely on these open source technologies are the ones that are actually contributing back upstream to these uh, to mm -hmm. these projects. Yeah, and if I if I uh, you know ex extrapolate what you said into the university context, you know, there are labs, <laughs> one or two people that are doing <laughs> open source development, and maybe you know the DevOps. At least they think they're doing the DevOps. Um, so you know that's not going to change, right, in, in a university setting. And some of that is experimental, and it's intentionally designed. You know, it can be used to train grad students or whatever. It's, it's maybe not ever intended to see the light of day, um, but no matter how much a university says, we have this entity, whatever it is, providing you the kind of technical support you need, faculty are always gonna have the autonomy and freedom, and in some cases, really the research, compelling research interest to do that stuff on their own, right? So I, I don't know that that'll happen at CMU, but I can tell you right now, nobody's come to me and said, I, I need to hand you my project. Right, and you need to maintain it, run it for me. Um, that that may never happen. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not pushing for it either. Right, I want to be useful in the way that makes the most sense. Yeah, get you know, getting back to the metrics that you were talking about, I do I do kind of like having sort of a common set of metrics though that uh, universities can use to help them to help them really make decisions and and generate insights about what it is that that they need to be thinking about do they do they need an open source program office um you know what what would it look like i you know i i do i do like that idea i'm not i'm not sure how to implement it uh, like it's 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 sort of hard to pick a set of of metrics that would apply across all of these different use cases that we were just just sort of talking about but i but i really like the idea of doing it yeah, I mean, I, I think we'll have to start, or at least I think, we'll have to start at a very high level, right? Um, so even things like being included in proposals, number of students, you know, being educated about open source, working on open source, um, you know, number of hackathons that students have open source as part of it and so on. Um, you know, one of the things we heard recently from one of the student groups at CMU is, you know, we have these hackathons, and then people graduate <laughs> and the next year we spin up stuff again that we know we did last year um you know can you help us <laughs> maintain some continuity between year-to-year -year hackathons and people graduating and not turning over admin rights and, and, and things like that so i think even starting at a high level um you know don you're i think you're exactly right to even starting at the high level the university can look at that and say you know we want more proposals with open source we want more students engaged with open source um and and how do we get there right and and that's where i think it's it's a much more powerful sequencing right that's how do you get there oh maybe it needs to be organized in an ospo rather than i have an ospo and now i'm here to help you well in what way what 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 are we moving toward right what's the target yeah would it be at all helpful done and say, if, if like I stop calling these things maturity models and stages of growth, um, because I, I get, I understand what you're saying, because they imply some progression towards something better. Sure. And um, because what you're talking about, Don, like to me, if we looked at this as like a, a suite of things that would be available to you to think about as an OSPO, irrespective of stages of growth or maturity, mm -hmm. like get rid of those words. And you're like, you know what? I do care about 
whatever education and in particular legal education wherever that might be let me think about some sample objectives that might be reasonable in that in mm -hmm. that box and the metrics that might help drive my understanding around that and I get rid of these levels you know what I mean like just that's all gone altogether and then this yeah. becomes more like a bricolage like like a you know you, you pick the pieces that you like yeah. mm -hmm. trying to attend to mm -hmm. and picking Never. one piece is no better mm -hmm. than picking or no, no. worse than picking right. 11 pieces yeah. every university is going to have a different mm -hmm. set of things that matter to them depending what they're into yeah mm -hmm. No, I mean, I, I like it. I think it is more of a, you know, picking and choosing the things that that yeah. you and your organization need, um, I think right. is a better way to frame it than a majority. Stages stages of growth or maturity. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and I, and, you know, imagine a scenario where we actually coordinate this across universities, right? So one of the ways you make the choices is I know that MIT and Illinois are dealing with the, that dimension. I don't need to go replicate it, right? I can just learn from them. Um, so I think it gives us that option as well. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I like that idea very much of, you know, here are the, the goals. I, I mean, I think we talked about this earlier, Paul's, but here are the goals, right, that we're trying to achieve. Here, here are the the measures for that and here in the metrics and that's they, something yeah and it's objective goal whatever the right term yeah, is right mm -hmm. um and it's just mapped to these different dimensions right yeah. so you know faculty may not dive deeply into the legal but yeah. they should at least know about it <laughs> um but you know to sean's point there are people in the university who will dive into the legal right and say yeah we want to look at these things very deeply okay um this is helpful uh more work to do I, I like kind of sorting this out which is really great um and maybe that leads to kind of there was an action item say that you had you had mentioned kind of yes in this and maybe you could speak to this just a little bit I don't yeah know. yeah if you if you're not familiar with helios um I, I don't know if it's on their website um they keep saying helios maybe it's not an acronym oh no it is there it is higher education uh, leadership initiative for open scholarship I, I don't always remember that um but the uh the, the national academy of uh science engineering medicine had a so-called round table and if you're not familiar with sort of the nas hierarchy of things uh round tables at the highest level there's round tables and then there's committees and working groups and the reports that come out are weighted and and sort of assessed according to the hierarchy so this was a round table um, and you know what that means is like university presidents were involved and university provosts and so on. That roundtable was about um, uh, aligning incentives for open science. And as part of that effort, uh, Helios was kind of a spin-off. So it's not an official National Academies group um, or, or, or entity, but it's very much tied to it. Just this week, there was another National Academies event uh, and the Helios people basically were running and facilitating it. So there's there's clearly some connection there. Um, I think it's like nearly a hundred members now. I, I I lose track every time I ask them. It's in it's a larger number. Um, yeah. So you can you can see you know a wide range of uh, all U.S. I believe, uh, but nonetheless wide range of institutions that are now members. And there are a few working groups that have been uh, formed in in this uh helios network and one of them um yeah thank you um one of them is looking at uh promotion and tenure um and you know what what not not just open source open scholarship more broadly but what does open scholarship mean in the in the promotion and tenure process uh and and, and so on so i contacted them and basically said you know and right now it means well, nothing by the way <clears throat> exactly yeah we're you know you can think of that as a real opportunity, I guess. Yeah, no, it really is. It's genuine. <laughs> it's, it's, right it's right genuine, now, it's genuine nobody cares. An opportunity for sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I've argued before that you know articles. Yeah, I know they're important, but what a mess. If other people want to go deal with them, great, go for it. Uh, data, out, of course, but you know you immediately encounter a lot of case legitimate cases, patient data. You know minor youth data, 
whatever, you know, export control data, whatever. There's lots of cases where the data is legitimately not shareable. And, and sadly, many institutions sort of default to that. Like, mm -mm -mm -mm. Yeah, there I mean, are all these reasons why we can't. Yeah, shareable um, data is fraught with challenges. Challenges, but but yeah. but open source software, right? I mean, good grief, the faculty yeah. are putting this stuff out there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we, exactly we, we right. should jump. We should jump on this, right? So uh, I I made that point to Helios, and I think um, uh, Chris Borg, who's the director of libraries at MIT, is I believe the chair of of that particular working group. And I know Chris very well, and I've reached out to her as well. Um, and you know, I can't I can't speak with the working group. I'm I'm not on it, and I haven't attended their meetings. But I think um, Chris is a very I, I mean, she's a great leader and strategy vision all that but she's a very let's get something done kind of person so i think um if we were to show up with version 0 0.1 right you know poke at it you tell us what's wrong with it all that stuff of a set of university metrics um i think that, that you know chris is the kind of person who would take it to this group and say look now we've got something you know from which we can start uh, you want to still think about articles and data, that's great. But if we can do something around software, and this is coming from a group, you know, that has nice representation, even outside of universities, right? Um, All right if I can uh, chime in, Saeed. Stephen, are you, are you on that group? Oh. The, no, I'm, I'm actually on the okay. better group, probably, which is the best practices group. And I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm the co-lead of the best practices group, so. Okay. Uh, sorry to be late. Life is what it is. But um, if Which we're best talking practices about group it, is that, Stephen? For the best practices group in Helios. That's so how you. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Got it. So it, it kind of straddles between the group that um, Chris is on, which is the policy stuff, if I recall, and the good practices group, which I'm co-lead of um, and there's this this cross-sector alignment one tends to as you might guess from its name work across all three of the other ones so um, you can start with either of us but you may as well start with me yeah. I'm involved yeah, with all the, the, I'm involved with all the groups and Chris would have to be brought up to speed that's right. No, thank you. <laughs> and did I did I understand earlier, Saeed, your thoughts with Helios? This is even earlier, like 30 minutes ago when you mentioned Helios for the first time. That your thoughts that if if metrics can be brought forward in this particular context, that that through a group like Helios might be more powerful than trying to do it simply like by yourself at CMU with university press like that yeah. might be a more powerful path. yeah no, no nothing will happen if I do this alone at CMU okay <laughs> uh, I, I mean it may, maybe it's CMU I I shouldn't I shouldn't pretend <laughs> sorry that was we can we can yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know too, it's... too loose a statement but yeah I I think Helios um you can see from some of the leads right and and, and Stephen certainly jump in that it's it's like high level university administration is involved um, in, yep. in some way or another. So it's it's become, um, you know, that, that there are these other groups, like I said, the American Association of Universities, and American and public and land grant universities, and the presidents meet and the provosts meet and so on. But I mean, I, I've never been to one of these meetings, but goodness knows what they talk about, right? They probably have all kinds of things. I, I did hear from our provost at Hopkins once that they were talking about college sports for like two hours. That's really sobering. That's um, that's not our group. Uh, I'm I'm happy to talk in depth. That, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, he, he, Helios is is I think an attempt to tap into those people, but really keep it focused tightly okay. on open scholarship, um, and and focused around you know what changes can we make in the spirit of that report that the National Academy has produced about aligning incentives, right? So if it's aligning incentives, the incentives should ideally be tied to some metrics, right? So I, I think we're being entirely consistent with what Helios is trying to do. Um, so Helios knows that RIT has been working with you guys and other folks for a while around scholarly metrics in general. And, and they're aware of the, the mystic project that we're working on 
Um, so I think I shared with the chaos folks, the SF Dora building blocks document. Um, do you guys yeah. remember that? Do you want me to yep. find it again real quick? Uh, you could, but you, you have shared it with us. Yeah. Steven, maybe you could drop it in the doc. Yeah, I'm looking we, for it now. Yeah. So let's see here. Uh, okay, we'll say you did answer my question. So this thing, There's right? a, a bit of, it's probably a better workflow to go and partner with Helios, or at least put this in front of folks at Helios. Yeah, and, and Stephen, uh, certainly not intended to reflect on you in particular. Um, and I'd be curious to hear what you think. But you know, one of the concerns I have about Helios is it is about 100 institutions. Um, how do you get 100 institutions to move <laughs> um, you know, in, in unison or in concert or whatever the right word is? So I, I'm of the opinion that having a smaller, more nimble group, say like this one, um, that can think about a topic and take it to a Helios is, is better than trying to have Helios spin something up like this and work on it from, from the beginning. That is, um, that is correct. The, the original yeah. goal, I mean, Helios is, is working on, uh, I don't want to say 50,000 foot per se, but, you know, them, they would much rather have somebody like me representing this group building you know bringing that to for input they are um if you go to the helio site um let me see let me just find the part i want to go to yeah so so if you go to the our work section where these yeah. issue briefs are for the moment, where's the, what's, ah, oh, here it is, this thing. So the year of open science one oh, is currently cool. quite ugly because it's a draft, but this is going to get turned into a much more friendly, they, they, didn't, they didn't expect to get this volume of stuff this quickly. So they're working to build a kind of, you know, spreadsheet slash database slash something that better represents and is searchable for things like this and whatever we produce as a as a dot one analytics thing i can drop into this um the idea that that um you know saeed says that how do you get 100 groups to agree on anything um the answer is to a certain extent you don't right the idea of Helios is pretty much as you scroll down this kind of stuff, um, whoever's powering this. Right. Helios has started with 60 member organizations, both Hopkins and RIT were some of the first I can't remember if and when CMU came in is CMU in Saeed? CMU is in now. Yeah. Okay. So the idea of of having a larger group rather than a smaller one was just is just to be as this stuff gets collected to be able to say hey this is serious and it's not just five r ones right if you go through the helios member list there's community colleges there's state schools there's hbcus there's there's the spread right so the idea is the open scholarship, or as of course I like to say, the open work and academia initiative um, is important for everybody. And no matter who you are, 
you can see that all these different universities are engaged and there should be some things here. Nobody can do all of this all at once, but here are pathways and entry points that so over the next X years, we lift US academia of all flavors up to where we want it to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. I yeah so, and I think, I think, but all of academia would being lifted up to where it ought to be is going to mean a lot of different categories or ways. Right, that, which is, yeah. which is why you see stuff like this, which is not overarching mm -hmm. examples, but find somebody who looks like you and here are pieces of what you're doing and read their stuff, reach out to them, work with them, that kind of thing, right? There's also a lot of pushing upward at, at the federal level through this entity and some other places to, to get the whole situation improved. So, so since they've cut off contributions to that year of open science thing, um, until they get the database up when they do the year of when they open that for members to submit to um, our website best practices stuff our early presentations and information about mystic will go in through us and I can put anything from this group up in there through best practices. That would be awesome. <laughs> so I think we have to maybe a, a task for us is to figure out what those things are, <laughs> create that right. structure and start putting that forward. Right. But, you know, my yeah. larger, you know, my larger point and, you know, my, my initial engagement with CAS to begin with is to getting up to, to yeah. get us thinking about overall scholarly stuff beyond yep. software and that building blocks document. Yep is um possibly a helpful guide we're basically for what we're doing with what we intend to do with mystic once we get the funding is to put more of that kind of stuff into it as well as the standard software stuff and we have this group that got started and is currently in very early days called the open work network which is looking at a bunch of these things, we're taking a bunch of documents like the building blocks and the um, Boyer scholarly stuff and the credit guidelines or taxonomy and other stuff and trying to munge them together in a, in a way that both industry and academia can look at them and get benefit from them. And so that's about 20 people from the the conference we held who are starting to look at that kind of stuff and okay. I think I think Saeed signed up to get the report outs from that is that right Saeed? Yeah um yeah, that's correct um yeah I, I, so I'm I'm just thinking about timing specifically for this meeting and then overall effort yeah. um yeah. so Stephanie and I had chatted about um, UC Santa Cruz has, I, I'm trying to remember the name of it, I can't now, <laughs> uh, an open source event, I'll just call it that, in late September. Yep. And um, we had talked about potentially, uh, you know, this group having a draft available to review at that symposium. Um, and people, people could participate virtually, they don't all have to go to Santa Cruz. Um, and then after that event, sort of, you know, taking the feedback and putting it together, saying, here you go, here's kind of a release of, of what we think is the first pass of these metrics. And then, you know, as Stephen said, I, I assume by then Helios will have, you know, figured out how to make this a database and things can be added that way. And in the meantime, um, you know, there's, I, I think at least there'll be at least a couple, maybe more of Helios meetings or events that'll take place before then. So Stephen and or I, you know, we'll make sure we're at, at, at those and can um, start socializing this there so that it's not a big surprise once it, okay. once it comes out. So Stephen, I've, I've talked to Greg and Caitlin uh, about this. Sure. So they're, they're aware um, and they're, they're the ones who said, maybe you should just mention, you know, it, you, know you being this group, mentioning it at, at one of those meetings. So I think that gives us, you know, a couple of months to sort of focus on this. Yep. And yeah, then, I've, got a, I've got a meeting with the, 
the good practices or best practices group next Friday. Okay. Okay. So maybe you can mention it there too. Um, yes, will do. Um, I like that, Saeed. I mean, if it does give us plenty of time between now and and that the uh, event at UC Santa Cruz. Right. Um, I'll rethink this for our earlier discussion, this metric model thing. Sure. I think it's important for us to have some framework <laughs> by mm -hmm. which to yeah, I agree. Yeah. carry those forward. So I'll rethink that based on this discussion. Um, I did, we are at the end of time. I did want to just, this last link here, this was something that came from Michelle Barker, mm. who I think many of you know with Risa. Um, and I asked if I could share this with the group here. So this was an email that had come from the Flemish Research Data Network about thinking about a lot of the things that we're talking about here. Um, and so I just, I wanted to put this on your, just put this in front of you and, and give you a chance to kind of read uh, Michelle's synopsis of the discussion that she had with the group. Yeah, um, I gotta find the, so we just dropped the link to the notes in the chat again since I came late. So with that, I, I can stay on for a little bit, but to everybody else, we are done. We're over time just a little bit. This is a really good conversation for me. I think it helped a lot just in terms of path um, and how to think about, just how to think about things. So thank you for that. Yeah, no, thank you. Good, good chat. Yeah, um, and enjoy your conference. Enjoy your <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks everyone, bye-bye. All right, take care. See ya. Um, I can hang out if you guys want to pick. Yeah, catch yeah me I can hang out. Or anything. Um, well, I'm going to have to drop off. So Sean, I'll make you, if you want to hang out. Host. Yeah, I'm Phil, I, I'm going to fill out that, uh, yeah, go ahead and make me host. I will fill out, I'm in the process of filling out that survey. I was trying to write last week, Stephen, and I'm catching up. So try to talk to you and Mike. I don't know if you still want to work together on. Um, yeah, I'm sure we do. Mike's heading to Spain. Okay. And he's so. going to be at CERN. Cool. While, while I'm at FOSSI. Okay. So. Yeah, I and I can't go to Fossey because it's my mom's 80th birthday celebration. Sure, I'll be your fucking priorities. Um, <laughs> you do the same thing. Yeah. So, um, where's that thing that that Matt just dropped in the notes? Um, the, the stages the of growth or the stuff from from Michelle. The last thing that he said, which I think was which, that was the stuff from the Michelle, yeah, the enriching research assessment. Yeah, and, I'm trying to find it in the notes. Here, uh, it's sort of highlighted, so it doesn't look like a regular Google link. I just put it in the Zoom chat. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right, cool. Got that. Um, so I, I mean I think this so this is another international directive trying to advance the notion that um, research assessment is more complex than just counting papers and money. H factor, H factor, H factor. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So in terms of setting something with me and Mike, yeah, probably best thing to do is to um set something up with us after your birthday party right so okay are you guys submitting a pose for yeah, this, uh, yeah you, should, for you the... should ask you should ask mike where he is with that too because that's because that we Grants, were thinking about... grants and stuff is now primarily his focus okay so um are you thinking of using your tool that starts with an m whose name is blanking on me right now we a... are looking for separate funding for mystic though mystic, we, okay we, we, we have reached out to the nsf but heard nothing from them. i i don't think mystic's ready enough for a pose um because we can't demonstrate use right and they're going to want to see who's your user base and we don't have one yet so um 
but I think if you do you have that link for both of our Calendly, Sean? Yeah, for some reason my laptop, I think I'm running some Jupyter notebooks and so my laptop is processing my email, but very slowly, but I'm gonna go to my other computer after we hang up and fill it out there. All right, so you, your best shot at getting both of us is gonna be from the 19th on. 19th on, okay. All right. I'll be back from Fossey and he'll be back from Spain and CERN. All right, yeah, he sent me that link last Thursday and it's, I was really trying not to pay attention to my email last week and I did okay on some fronts. All right, let me see if I can find it for you. Did no, I, I have I have it here. I know right where it is in my inbox. I just my mind frozen. Well, so. I'm I'm suggesting that for both of us to actually have our shit together to get it done mm -hmm. is it's best if we just do it now. So there's the link. <laughs> uh yeah, no, I, okay. There, okay. Uh, let me get back to Zoom. All right. Open our IT. I mean, 30 minutes or 60 minutes? Let's say 60. Go, go for 60. And if we end early, yeah. no one is going to complain, right? No times in June, June next month. Right. Boom. Loading. So July 5th and 6th, you're both listed as open, but wait till the 19th? Yeah, because we're going to need to do catch up on all the stuff he's missed. All right. So yeah, there's plenty of time on the 19th, 20th, and 21st. So just grab one that works for you. All right, let me just. Uh... All right, I am requesting 9 a.m. on the 19th. So I think that's good for big picture. I think yep. what you could grab on the 5th, or six mm -hmm. is one with him because I know he wants to have a talk with you on some auger stuff. Okay. So here's the one for just him. Yeah. No, I know I've been working with one of your students. And, right. Uh, so I would do. And I, I think he tried to reach me last week, but I can't seem to find him. Yeah. So, and again, I, I I have Mike and Chris deal with that. <laughs> he's got time available on the fourth of July. <laughs> yeah, because well, he's in the UK. He didn't think to block. Yeah, it yeah, yeah. I guess not, but I'm pretty sure I don't. So well, and and he's he's not supposed to work on the fourth anyway. So yeah, yeah. Let's see where I... grab grab a slice with uh, him specifically for auger stuff, and then that larger conversation with all three of us can happen on nineteen twenty or twenty one. Whatever you just reserved that I saw. I just, yeah, I just, I did just reserve it. All right. And I just, uh, all right, I scheduled them for 9 a.m. on July 5th for the auger stuff. So, yeah, I think that's perfect. All right. Thanks, Stephen. Talk to you soon. All right. Take care, buddy. Bye. My Zoom will not end. Zoom is also frozen.